Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So let me start. Um, I have uh, uh, the pleasure of introducing very briefly Demis Asabis. And this is continuing a tradition that I started with Christoph. Um, he's uh, much better known than I am, and he was a postdoc with me, Demis. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, he's ideal for today because he's a mixture of uh, a neuroscientist and a technologist and an entrepreneur. So um, it's great to be here. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah, cool. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, because of the symposiums, about neuroscience and brains and minds, as well as machines. Um, I'm going to focus sort of most of my talk around systems neuroscience and how it can be maybe helpful uh, towards uh, in helping us progress in our quest for building AI. So I'm the CEO of DeepMind. DeepMind was founded in 2010. Uh, and then we joined forces with Google in 2014 to sort of accelerate progress towards our mission of solving intelligence. Um, one way you can think about DeepMind is a kind of like an Apollo program effort for AI. So we have um, over 150 research scientists now, so I think it's the largest collection anywhere of sort of machine learning researchers on this single topic. But also, um, one of the things we try to do with DeepMind is uh, come up with a new approach to organizing and doing science. So we've tried to combine and take the best from the best academic institutes and combine that with what's best from, you know, the, 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 the greater sort of Silicon Valley style startups. And we've tried to kind of create a hybrid environment that um, maximizes um, and is and sort of optimized for research progress to try and make it as efficient and productive and collaborative as possible. So what we do at DeepMind is we're sort of interested in algorithms. We call them um, general purpose learning algorithms. And uh, we're only really interested in algorithms that can learn automatically from raw inputs or directly from raw experience. So are not pre-programmed or handcrafted in any way. And we're also interested in this notion of generality. So the idea that the set, a same single system or single set of algorithms can operate out of the box across a wide range of tasks. And in fact, this relates to our operational definition, if you like, of intelligence that we use at DeepMind, which is um, we define it as the ability to perform well across a wide range of environments. So while I agree with Tommy and I think um, some of the other speakers today about that you know, intelligence is quite an amorphous term, um, we found that operationalizing it like this and putting generality at the center of it um, works very well for us. Um, and you could argue, well, what about all these different properties that that doesn't cover, you know, creativity, et cetera. But actually, then it just depends on the tasks that you include um, in the set of tasks that you're going to try and attempt. So the wider and the, the more diverse, the better. So we call this um, type of AI artificial general intelligence, or AGI. And the hallmark of, this kind of these kinds of algorithms is that they're flexible and adaptive, and perhaps even one day inventive, um, and they're built to deal with the unexpected um, from the beginning. Now, contrast that with um, a lot of what's called AI out there, which we mostly term narrow AI, which is often handcrafted or special cased um, for a specific problem, and therefore can be very brittle. Um, if something unexpected happens, it will just catastrophically fail. So one of the other um, sort of philosophies, I guess, that we committed to at the start of DeepMind was the idea of grounded cognition. So this is the idea that, uh, or the notion that a true thinking machine has to be grounded in a sensory motor data stream. Now, um, this kind of gives rise to notions of end-to-end -end learning agents, you know, that perhaps start with raw vision, so maybe pixels on a screen, and um, go all the way to making a decision about what action to take. And we're interested in that entire stack of things that's involved, um, all the way from perception to decision making. Now, usually when people talk about grounded cognition or embodied cognition, um, people start working on or thinking about robots. And um, of course, that's the ultimate grounding, robots in the real world. 
but actually we decided to start off with simulations and specifically games. Um, and we think that games are a pretty perfect platform for developing and testing AI algorithms, um, especially these kinds of grounded algorithms. So firstly, obviously you can create unlimited training data by running the game um, as much as you like. Uh, there's no testing bias because um, the games were designed to be challenging to, for humans. Obviously, they were designed by game designers uh, for the purpose of entertainment, not for testing AIs. So often, I think one of the things that has held back the AI field is that usually it's the algorithmic developers who, um, the algorithm developers who also develop the tests. Um, and that can lead to a kind of unconscious bias about um, what the tests um, really test for. Of course, compared to uh, robots, um, you can parallel test uh, these algorithms, you know, run millions of agents at once, all playing the games. And it's also quite convenient in most games they have scores, so it's very convenient for us to measure incremental progress. If you make some small change to an algorithm, you can quickly see uh, and quantify the difference it's made. So we really love games, and of course, we also like robots, um, and we're very interested in robots as a, as a sort of application um, of AI. But um, not, you know, in, in terms of development, we mostly focus on simulation. So I guess our most sort of widely known work to date is our work on deep reinforcement learning, where I think um, we showed for the first time quite an impressive uh, uh, use of deep reinforcement learning um, when we used it on um, the classic Atari games um, from the 80s, Atari 2600 games. So I'm just going to run a quick video of, some of, of, the, of the agent playing these games. But just to be clear, for those who haven't seen this, sort, this video before, you know, what the agent's getting here um, are just the raw pixels as inputs, so around 30,000 pixels per frame. And the goal here is to maximize the score. Everything else is learned from scratch. And here it's a single system. Um, we insist on a single system that plays all the different games without any um, tweaking of the hyperparameters. So we call this system DQN after DQ, Deep um, Q Network. And here's a sort of little medley of the same system um, playing um, you know, half a dozen games. And you can see, for those of you who don't know about Atari games, how different um, in style they are visually, um, also in terms of their objectives. Um, they're incredibly diverse. And, uh, and this same system could you know, effectively master all of these games. Now, um, when we um, sort of published our Nature paper on this, we were better than human um, at just over half the games. And now we're um, superhuman level at um, all but five of them. So if, you, if, if you're interested in, uh, so here's a bo the boxing example where, uh, you know, here the, on the, it's, the, it's the red boxer on the left-hand side um, playing the inbuilt AI. And so if you're interested in, in the details of this, uh, uh, you know, it's all um, in, the, in the Nature article, including our code, which is available online, so you can, you can play with DQN yourself. So given we're here talking about brains and minds as well as machines, um, what about the brain? And in fact, DQN and why one of the reasons it worked so well was partially inspired by neuroscience um, and specifically hippocampal replay, the idea of replaying your experiences so that you can maximize the use of that information. Uh, and that was critical. Um, uh, the use of replay was critical in making DQN tractable um, in a reasonable amount of time when it was training on these games. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk now just discussing my own view on uh, you know, how systems neuroscience uh, should be integrated with AI. So first the thing to talk about is, you know, often I get asked, well, why bother with the brain or neuroscience at all? You know, there are probably many other ways of um, building intelligence. Uh, and that might well be true. But I think um, there's a couple of arguments to take neuroscience seriously. First of all, um, I think it's, it's likely that the, the number of possible solutions is actually very small compared to the size of the search space. So if that's actually true, then it's probably worth honing in on and trying to reverse engineer, at least to some extent, um, the solution that we know exists. And after all, the brain is the only existence proof we have that general intelligence is possible at all. Now, that might all be very well, but if it would be no point talking about it if we didn't have um, amazing now new techniques and data streams to actually analyze and to give us information about um, uh, what's going on inside the brain. And pretty much yearly now, um, amazing new techniques get developed. So all the way from optogenetics, kind of atomics, two-photon microscopy, you know, the, the list um, goes on and on now. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a huge proliferation now of amazing techniques to get ever closer to what's going on in the brain. And this is all resulting in a kind of exponential increase in our understanding of the brain. 
Of course, we've got a long way to go. Um, you know, I'm not saying we have a good full or, or even close to um, full understanding of what's happening with the brain. Um, but there are many clues now, many interesting nuggets of information that, if used in the right way, I think can be helpful for AI development. So I see there's sort of two, uh, uh, you know, kind of two buckets, if you like, uh, of, um, you know, the purpose of uh, neuroscience in terms of how it can help uh, AI development. So firstly, and um, maybe more obviously, it can provide um, direction. So research direction and inspiration for new types of algorithms, architectures, and um, even analysis techniques for analyzing uh, these machine learning systems. And I think we should be looking um, to neuroscience where we have the least idea or the most uncertainty, if you like, about what to do in machine learning um, to solve a particular problem or to, to have a particular capability. And also, I think something that um, we're pushing very hard on at DeepMind is building uh, and taking um, inspiration from the analysis and visualization tools that are now quite mature in neuroscience, um, say for analyzing fMRI images, um, and then applying that in some analogous way to analyzing machine learning systems. And another interesting thing is actually uh, the experimental techniques and design techniques that are kind of standard in uh, things like fMRI, which um, in terms of controlling for uh, what you're looking for in an experiment. And that's something, again, that in machine learning, um, you know, hasn't come across yet. And I think could be very useful, this sort of idea of designing these kinds of experiments that we do in neuroscience. And the second way I think um, neuroscience can, can end up being useful is what I call validation testing. So if you have some idea of, or notion of you know, your favorite type of algorithm, maybe it's reinforcement learning, you know, and you're sort of arguing with another machine learner that actually um, this should constitute or could constitute a viable component of an overall AGI system, you know, how much effort, how do you decide if this is, uh, you know, if this is a reasonable conjecture? And um, you know, so maybe you go away and you start trying to build a system and probably it doesn't work straight away. So then you've got to decide like, how much more effort should be put into that um, you know, is it just a question of another few years and then something viable will happen and something interesting will happen? So it's, it's very difficult decisions to be made, um, especially if you're running a large group or um, you have a large team of where should you put your effort? And I think um, if you can point to a system in the brain that, um, that analogously does that, uh, uh, sort of mimics that algorithm or, or indeed that algorithm mimics that part of the brain, then I think um, that can give us confidence that we should put more effort into that um, area of research and that ultimately it will, it will yield some fruit. Um, and in fact, that's what we thought about with reinforcement learning and why we committed to that so heavily because the brain indeed and most biological systems use forms of reinforcement learning like TD learning um, in order to learn about their environment. But this, you know, the next question then is, you know, if you're going to take neuroscience seriously, there's so much neuroscience. So what parts of neuroscience should we be paying attention to? And um, so here I like quoting sort of David Marr's three-level analysis, or it should be called Tommy, Tommy's uh, three-level analysis as well, because I think um, Tommy was involved in, uh, heavily in this. And uh, David Marr used to say in the 70s, um, probably one of the founding fathers of computational neuroscience, that to fully understand a complex biological system, you need to understand it on three levels. The computational level, which is what the, the what, if you like, the goals of the system. An algorithmic level, so the how, so the representations and algorithms the system uses. And the implementation level, you know, i.e. the sort of physical substrate um, that realizes the system. So those are the three levels you need if you want to fully understand, say, the brain. But actually, I think for um, machine learning and AI development, um, really the top two levels are the most important. Um, so at DeepMind, we focus on the kind of computational and algorithmic levels uh, um, when we come to analyze uh, neuroscience in the brain. So collectively, um, I refer to that as systems neuroscience. And really what we're interested in then, then is the algorithms and the representations and the architectures um, that the brain uses. And we're working on all sorts of sort of um, cutting edge areas where uh, we're using um, systems neuroscience ideas as well as, of course, machine learning ideas to try and make progress on. So here's just a sort of uh, a, a kind of summary of some of the areas that we're looking on at the moment and currently focusing on representations, memory, attention, concepts, planning, navigation, imagination. And in fact, in terms of parts of the brain, um, Christoph was talking earlier about, you know, prefrontal cortex and, and, and uh, high-level cortex. But actually, one of the old parts of the brain 
the hippocampus, which is this bit of the brain in, in pink here in the middle, um, is, turns out to be quite critical for a lot of these um, capabilities. So let's talk about some of those in, in order. Let's still talk about memory first. Um, so we've been experimenting a lot with memory and adding memory to neural networks. So one way you can think about the work we're doing is you take a classical computer, we implement um, a sophisticated recurrent neural network, perhaps with some LSTMs, and then we give it a huge memory store um, that um, it can learn to control. And then that whole system is differentiable end to end. And then what we end up with is what we're dubbing this neural Turing machine, as it's called a neural Turing machine, um, in the sense that uh, it's, it has all the components now um, that a Turing machine would need, um, but it's neural in the sense that it's learned by, from input and output examples. So here's a sort of cartoon diagram of the, of the architecture. So you've got the, um, in the center there in the CPU, the controller is the recurrent neural network. Um, and then uh, there's the input and output tape you can think of. And it learns by example, input, output examples. And it learns to control this a very large memory store on the right. Uh, and, and it learns to read and write from that. Now, I haven't got time to go into this in detail today. And in fact, I think Alex Graves is giving a talk on this right at the moment. Um, but also, uh, Greg Wayne is giving a talk about this at uh, 5 o'clock tomorrow in another one of the workshops. So he'll be going into much more detail about this work if you're interested. But I'm just going to show you a couple of videos of sort of some of the latest things we've been able to do with neural tree machines over the last year. So um, we looked at this one of these classical problems from um, old-fashioned AI, I guess, back from the 80s. Um, Shrewdaloo, which is a blocks world problem. And um, the idea is that you're trying to manipulate these blocks, you know, put the green block on the red block or put the blue pyramid inside the white box. Um, and you can also answer questions about uh, uh, the scene as well. Now, we're not ready to tackle full Shrewdaloo yet, um, but uh, we created a kind of mini version of Shrewdaloo, if you like. So a mini blocks world where um, now we're looking side on onto this block world. And the sort of task we created was, um, imagine a configuration of, of blocks here on the left. You have this starting configuration, um, and you've got a goal configuration on the right-hand side. And um, the system has to convert the start configuration into the goal configuration um, by moving one block at a time. So the only moves that are allowed are moving the top block um, to, the block, uh, to any of the columns, adjacent columns. Um, so it's a little bit like a complex Tower of Hanoi problem. And it's actually quite difficult for humans to do in some sort of you know, uh, reasonably optimal way. So I'm just going to run this video um, and show you how the neural tree machine does. So in the middle here, you see it trying to uh, change the star configuration into the goal configuration. And note, obviously, it's never seen this type of configuration before. So obviously, the start configuration, the goal configuration are totally new. It's, it's learned this from examples, seeing other examples of um, solutions from other positions. You can see there it's, it's solved the problem. And then we have uh, actually a language, a sort of mini language version of this, where we describe now the constraints in terms of little language instructions rather than an example end board. And um, so we, if you see down at the bottom here, um, hopefully you can see that the little constraints, so like block three needs to be down from block five, block four needs to be up from block two, um, block one needs to be um, up from block four, and so on. And so we give a bunch of these constraints, uh, and then from the start position, the uh, neural tree machine has to reach an end position that satisfies all those constraints. So I'll show you that again here. So it reads in the constraints letter by letter. And then when it sees the question mark, it knows that it's supposed to um, execute a solution. So we can see there at the end there that that uh, final ball configuration actually satisfies uh, all those constraints, um, three down from five, four up from two, one up from four, and six down from three. And it does that in, a, in, a, in, a, in an optimal way. So that's uh, memory. So what about concepts? So we would like to have abstract concepts because it's going to be key for so many things, including transfer learning, which um, you know, I think is one of the keys to flexible general intelligence. So we define transfer learning as the ability to apply previously learnt knowledge appropriately to a new situation to help your performance in that new situation. And that breaks down into at least three sort of sub-steps. One is you've got to identify the salient features in your current environment, and more importantly, ignore the irrelevant features. Then you need to re-represent those features as an abstract concept, so sort of divorce from the perceptual features that you learnt them in. 
And then once you have these library of concepts, you need to be able to select and appropriately apply those uh, to any new situation that you encounter. So probably step two of this is the probably, I mean, all these things are very challenging, but step two is probably the, the most challenging and the most critical. And really, I think from the beginning of DeepMind, we've identified learning abstract concepts as um, one of the key uh, breakthroughs that are needed uh, towards getting us to um, AGI. And you can see this diagram, you know, this sort of missing gap. On the left-hand side, you know, you can think of information in the brain crudely split into three levels, like perceptual information, this abstract conceptual information, and finally symbolic information like words. And there's been a lot of work, obviously amazing progress in the last decade on um, with things like deep learning in terms of dealing with perceptual information. Um, and obviously there was a lot of work in the 80s on logic networks. But there's this missing piece in the middle um, which would allow um, the, the symbols to be grounded and also from, um, to go from perceptual information up to truly abstract information. Now I think as uh, Gabriel showed and Gabriel, and, uh, you know, when I was doing my PhD in neuroscience in London, I was, this was one of the um, key results that I noticed um, that were quite amazing to me in terms of clues about how the brain might do this. So these are Jennifer Aniston neurons. I think Gay will cover this earlier. Um, you know, these are neuro this is a neuron that only fires to Jennifer Aniston pictures and only when she's on her own, not when she's with Brad Pitt. So, um, so, so uh, you know, so this is very specific. And here's a Halle Berry neuron, you know, where here um, it can be, you know, drawings of her, not particularly good drawings, in fact. And, uh, you know, where, one where she's dressed up as Catwoman. Um, so, and, you know, another one where it's just her, the text of her name. And so, you know, these are really abstract neurons in some sense that are representing um, the concept of Halle Berry. Halle Berry. So then, um, you know, we've done a lot of experiments. I did some of my PhD with my colleague Darshan Kumaran, where we looked at conceptual learning in the brain with fMRI studies. And um, so in this study here, we had uh, people learning about fractal patterns. Um, um, so they saw two fractal patterns on, on, a, on, a, on a TV screen, and they had to predict the weather outcome of the next day, whether it would be sunny or rainy. And they learned this by trial and error. And eventually, you find what you learn is that um, there's some underlying pattern. So um, certain fractals, you can ignore where they're positioned. Um, and others, um, other fractals, you can ignore their identity. And it's just important where they're positioned on the screen. So these are kind of underlying rules that were um, independent of the fractals themselves. And we scanned people learning this task uh, uh, while they were learning the first task. And then once they mastered that, there was a second task where now we changed the fractals um, to new fractals, but the underlying rules were the same, were kept the same. And we scanned them learning the second task, and they were much faster at learning the second task. And what was really interesting is that um, the part of the brain that correlated with this increased learning in the second uh, task, um, when we were scanning in the first task, was actually the hippocampus. So the amount of activity in the hippocampus in the first task predicted later transfer uh, uh, to the second task, being improved on the second task. So it seems quite strong evidence that then that the hippocampus here, um, it's, it's quite difficult for me to point at it from the state podium here, the hippocampus here um, is very critical in learning concepts. Here's another famous study actually of um, a sleep study uh, also related to um, probably hippocampal replay and uh, the learning of concepts. So in this one, the concept you're trying to learn is this linear hierarchy that A is better than B, that's better than C, better than D, E, and F. But you, you don't see that whole hierarchy at once. You only see the individual pairs. So you see that you, 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 you get shown B and A together, B and C together, and so on. And you have to learn by trial and error which one of the two is better. But you never see the whole hierarchy uh, and the joins between. So your brain kind of has to infer this from those individual uh, premise pairs. And what's interesting about this study is that when they did this and they tested people um, 20 minutes later on the separated pairs, so maybe like was B um, better than D, then uh, people are at chance level 20 minutes later. But after 12 hours or 24 hours and a night of sleep, they're now up to 80% uh, or 90% successful on the, the sort of separated pairs, the inference pairs. Um, but even after 20 minutes, there's no difference on remembering the premise pairs. So it's really this, in, this sort of um, extraction of conceptual information that's happening um, during the sleep. So what about representations? So um, here's another thing that I saw that made me think about this is a huge clue to how representations are um, structured in the brain. 
Um, so there's this very famous effect in psychology called the DRM effect. And what happens here, just briefly, is that you get shown as a subject um, lists of words. So maybe let's take that top list, dark, cat, white, and coal. And you get, you get shown all these study words and you're told to memorize them. And then later, you get tested on these words. And you get tested on, like, did you see the word cat? And you say yes, no. Um, but there's also, critically, some lure words. Um, so like here, the word black, or the word river, or the word cold, which are related to those lit word lists, but were not shown during the study phase. And actually, people get um, fooled very reliably um, to say that they see, they've seen the word black, or they've seen the word river, um, when they didn't actually see it during the study phase. And this is an incredibly reliable effect. So it's been known since the 60s, it was rediscovered in the 90s, and it's been repeated like, you know, it's in thousands of psychology experiments. It's one of the most cited studies. But interestingly, no one had thought about doing this with fMRI. So what we decided to do is look at this with fMRI, where now, you know, you can think about, well, what's going on in the brain, and um, why is this happening? And one of the reasons we thought was that um, a partial priming effect. So the idea is that, you know, these, the neural representations underlying these words are maybe partially overlapping. Um, perhaps they were learned because of the way they were learned through similar experiences. And we thought maybe the degree of overlap would predict um, how, how much the brain of that individual would be fooled into thinking um, that they'd seen that world. Because perhaps all these partial primings of these partial overlaps would end up creating a full uh, a priming effect on the word, which is maybe the way the brain judges whether you've seen something recently or not. And that's what we found, is that actually once we started scanning people, looking at these lists, these word lists, and being tested on the DRM effect, we found that afterwards there was one part of the brain that predicted whether reliably whether individuals uh, were going to get confused about whether they saw a specific word. And the part of the brain that, that, that was predicting that was the anterior temporal lobe, here highlighted in the yellow. Um, and that's actually known to be the area that's involved in semantic dementia. So that's the part of the brain that goes wrong when you have semantic dementia. So it's, so it's actually where we predicted these types of conceptual semantic representations would be. And I think this study now shows a little bit about how those representations might be organized. So with imagination now, then as the final part, you know, we, we, this is something I also did in my PhD, was looking at how people imagine and plan for the future. And one thing we decided to test on was hippocampal patients. So patients without hippocampuses, damage to the hippocampus, could they imagine? We know that they're amnesic, we know they don't have episodic memory, but they, could they imagine things about the future? And so we tested them with imagine things like cues, like imagine you're lying on a white sandy beach in a beautiful tropical bay, describe what you can see. And when we looked at the patient descriptions, they were hugely impoverished, specifically in their spatial coherence. So what that means is that they couldn't bind the disparate components of a scene into a coherent whole. And you can see their performance here. They're the dark bar. Um, this is a measure of a kind of um, richness of their description. And they're massively impoverished compared to age and education matched and, and um, verbal matched controls on the right hand side. We then took this in the scanner and we found that, of course, the hippocampus is critical, but there's also um, a whole brain network, a very reliable one, that mediates imagination um, and uh, is also involved in episodic memory. So then one interesting thing you can think of, and we, did, we haven't touched on this, is also about animal intelligence. You know, there's not only human intelligence. I think we can also learn a lot from animal intelligence. So I was fascinated to, to see whether rats can actually imagine. And um, so we designed this study um, that I think was quite elegant and quite simple to show, I think, categorically that rats can imagine. So we first of all, we looked at play cells. So for those of you who don't know, play cells are um, neurons in the hippocampus of a rat that signal where a rat is in a location. So here we've got top down looking at a box that a rat is in, and, um, and these are two cells, A and B, that uh, fire only in that position in the box. What we can also, we also know from previous rat studies is that sequences of these cells play when a rat runs along a trajectory, like a linear track. So here, A, B, C, D, in the, in, and it replays um, in the order that the rat moved in. We also know that when the rat goes to sleep, these uh, trajectories are replayed at very speeded rates probably to aid learning. So what we did is we designed a team maze. And um, so now again, we're looking top down. The rat, there's a barrier on this team maze that stops the rat reaching the arms, but the barrier is see-through. So the rat can see the arms, it just can't move there. So initially in the first phase, the rat runs up and down um, the stem of the team maze. And we give it a reward. We show it a reward on the right-hand side. It can see the, the food pellet, but it can't reach it. 
Then the rat goes to sleep and we're recording from the rat's brain at this point. And uh, it's very important this because we're, this, is, this is the critical data that we come back to to analyze. Then in the second session, we remove the, ba the, the, the barrier. So now the rat can freely move up and down the T maze. And so now on the arms of the T maze, we can find its place cells. So here A and D. And what we find is that when we go back to the, analyze the sleep phase, that in fact, these place cells uh, were being replayed or preplayed, if you like, during that sleep, even though the rat had never experienced it yet. So it only, it only seen it. Maybe it was thinking about moving towards the food pellet. So this is the first time that anyone's ever shown um, imagined place cells. Um, and what was very cool was that there were significantly more pre-plays, if you like, to the right-hand arm where the food pellet was than to the left-hand arm in every one of the four rats. So I think that's pretty categorical that this was actually behaviorally relevant as well. So we're now um, looking at imagination-based or model-based planning in, um, for our Atari agents. And this is a very, you know, this is an early version of um, some of the models that we're trying to build in, and, and use in planning. So I'm just going to end with integrated agents. So if you now combine all the things I've been talking about into a single agent, then perhaps we have something that could be deemed rat level AI. So it would be able to do unsupervised vision, attention, have memory, episodic memory, navigate around mazes, and uh, perhaps even do imagination based planning. Um, and I think, you know, rat is pretty smart. So um, if we can get to this level, that'd be pretty spectacular. And maybe you can think of the Atari agent as a sort of lizard level. So here, here's a little um, sneak preview of the kinds of things we're working on. So this is now true feed 3D environments called Labyrinth. This we've extended it from an open source 3D engine, and this is uh, our agent navigating around, finding rewarding apples, and and uh, also exits out of the maze just from pixel inputs. So um, just from the, from the raw pixels. So we're um, doubling down on systems neuroscience at DeepMind. And I think there's an incredible wealth of information and ideas and clues if you, um, look, if you know where to look. And I think we're actually just at the beginning of the influence of neuroscience and AI on each other. And one thing we're especially excited about is developing new tools and techniques borrowed from neuroscience to help with the analysis of machine learning systems. So I think we're sort of entering a very exciting era now, and we're doubling down on these efforts. And uh, part of that is actually, um, I mean, you know, I'm very excited to announce that Professor uh, Matt Botvinnik, who many of you know from Princeton, is joining us full time from February to head up the neuroscience team and join our incredible sort of in-house team. And uh, you'll know a lot of his work, I'm sure, already from decision making and control and working memory. And we also have a bunch of collaborations with uh, Oxford and, of course, MIT with the CBMM program, Harvard, UCL and so on. Uh, and obviously, we're expanding the neuroscience team. and We're putting more into this. So if you're interested in the work, some of the work I've been talking about, then come and have a chat with me or Matt. So I'm just going to end by saying, you know, that actually we've talked a lot about how neuroscience can help AI. But I also think equally interesting, maybe we can discuss in the panel, is how AI might help us better understand the human mind, especially questions like that Christoph is interested in, like what actually is consciousness and is it necessary, for example, for intelligence? Um, and as Richard Feynman, one of my all-time heroes, said, what I cannot build, I do not truly understand. Um, and I think that's true of intelligence, too. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Um, we have time for a few questions. So, um. yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was intrigued by your that the, the you guys are now looking at um, imagination-based planning. Um, I guess one of the problems you have with, with that kind of uh, system is um, how does the agent, uh, an agent who acts, how does it know when it's uh, thinking about something that it's not currently doing versus when, when it should be thinking about things that it, that it is actually doing? And it seems like, um, in humans at least, we have some sort of cognitive level access to our own sort of attentional mechanisms. So we know what we're thinking about and we know perhaps the context and why we're thinking about it um, you know, in space and time. So if I, if I think about my, my birthday, a few days ago, and I'm not thinking about, you know, my, I'm not confused in that sense. Yeah, sure. I mean, we work on attention, both for sort of internal and external attention. I think that's going to be very important. Um, I think, uh, you know, actually the biggest issue with our uh, model-based planning stuff is that our, mo our, our generative models are pretty good. So if you measure them on compression or other things, measures, but um, the small errors compound very quickly. Uh, and so if you're trying to imagine, you know, hundreds of steps out, um, the errors get quite large. I think part of the issue is, is probably, um, you know, you don't want to actually be um, imagining on the pixel level, ideally. 
you want to be sort of measure, you know, imagining on some high level feature level, which again comes back to sort of concepts. So I would say that's the bigger problem than not knowing whether you're imagining or not. I mean, in an artificial system, we can make that distinction quite clear. So, yes. All right. uh, does that work? Yes, it does. Um, a quick comment and a question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning uh, this Bloxwell problem that yeah, you, hi Dennis, how are you doing? Yeah, um, uh, that, um, uh, that you were able to solve and you also mentioned that you think this is a more complex version of the Tiles of Hanoi problem. I think that's not the case simply because in the Tiles of Hanoi problem you have this additional constraint where you um, cannot place a larger disk on a smaller one, which means that if you have n disks, you n really need two, uh, two to the n moves, which means if you have 30 disks, you need a billion moves to solve the problem optimally, which is not the case in, in that particular um, reduced uh, blocks world setting. What is maybe more important for the uh, topic of this symposium here is, in the beginning you mentioned that um, you were inspired by neuroscience as you uh, did the Atari game uh, thing. and. Um, and, and you mentioned the action replay as an example. But that, of course, um, goes back to Lin, uh, 1991, who had a PhD thesis on reinforcement learning about um, action replay. And, um, and Which we did cite. We, yeah, of course, yeah, you should, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, that's, <laughs> that's good, then you do. And um, uh, the point is, however, is that this was driven by engineering considerations. Sure. And um, so the question is, do you have something where you really can show Neuroscience inspired us to do something better than standard engineering, which would maybe address exactly the I question think, of this. I um, think that's uh, a very difficult uh, bar because I think what you'll find is that uh, neuroscience ideas are sort of seeping around everywhere and help formulate certain ideas. And of course, you should be doing both at the same time. So I think uh, engineering should go hand in hand with the neuroscience and lots of ideas have been thought of in the machine learning and lots in the neuroscience and I think it helps they help each other sort of confirm that you're going in the right direction. I mean, even Convnets with, you know, Huber and Weasel, uh, you know, which ones influenced who? I mean, I'm sure, you know, you could say that the, the Convnets sort of came up, uh, you know, with little influence from that. But actually, I think these ideas are kind of all mixing together and help with this progress. So um, I don't know if you're asking for a specific example of exactly a neuroscience thing that was done uh, and then interpreted in machine learning. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, Confidence is actually a great example because that was, in my point of view, more or less the last time when neuroscience really produced uh, right. important inspiration for AI, which, because Fukushima's uh, convolutional networks in the 70s were inspired by uh, Hubel and Wiesel's result of, of the 50s. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think this is actually a good question for the panel also, um, where other people might um, come in. So. Um, Let's do this later, and maybe one, two quick questions. We're here. I'll try to be very quick. Um, I'm surprised that you rule out innate structure more or less altogether, and I wonder whether that's a methodological commitment. You said at the beginning you want to do everything kind of from raw pixels. You don't want anything built in. And there's a lot of evidence from biology that the genome is spending half of its effort, so to speak, trying to build a very carefully structured yeah. brain. So why ignore no, that No, no, for sure. So in fact, um, I should clarify that. So we're interested in sort of um, learning as far as possible sort of end to end, but we're not, uh, we're not against having modules or, I mean, clearly evolution has given some uh, initial constraints. So we're looking at those kinds of things as well. But we would like the prior knowledge that we build in to be as minimal as possible and as generic as possible. That's a, maybe another longer way of saying it. It's an empirical question what the right yeah. amount should be. Sure. Yeah, v very brief. Uh, uh, collaboration and competition have some neural bases in the frontal cortex. So, like, this, the, the agents are very independent. Um, what role do you think competition and collaboration play between learning systems? Uh, so, we're arranged in things like meta control, where, where there's, you know, more than one type of control system, and then you've got to decide uh, which system to trust or which system to switch to. So the brain, um, you know, definitely does that between model free and model based, perhaps between episodic controllers as well. So we're looking at that and, um, you know, implementing something similar to that, maybe, you know, deciding around uh, the uncertainty of each of the controllers. So we're looking at that moment. Yes. Okay. Oh, I should say thanks to all my colleagues, of course, at DeepMind, all the amazing people who've done all the work on, on the screen here and many more. Thanks. Thanks. Let's thank them again.
Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you.